All right, I'm going to call this meeting to order for October the 27th, 2015. You will rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Will you bow your heads with me for a brief prayer, please? Father God, I come to you tonight on behalf of the town of Rising Sun. I ask that you continue to uh, look over our citizens, God, and, and this elected body. Uh, I pray for uh, all those in need tonight, God, and um, all the military serving overseas. I ask, like I said, like you continue to watch over us um, and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First on uh, the agenda is approval of the October 13th town meeting. Um, everyone should have gotten a copy of that. Can I get a motion to approve the October 13th town meeting? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we're going to skip to business meeting items, is the October 19th town election results. Town administrator. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> the town election uh, was for two commissioner's uh, positions to serve for four years, starting at the first uh, town meeting in November, which I believe is November 10th. Um, as a result of that election, um, Brian Lashier was elected to fill one of the four-year terms, and Joseph Shepard was the other individual selected to um, serve in that four-year term. Again, uh, we made arrangements with the clerk of the courts, I believe, to come in at the November meeting and do the swearing in. Thank you, uh, town administrator. I just wanted to take a moment to officially welcome uh, Joseph Shepard and Brian Lashier. Uh, to our town board. Um, I've personally met both of these gentlemen uh, and I am uh, really excited for what they are going to bring to our town board. Uh, they are both hard workers um, and they are involved in our community um, and I'm excited to move Rising Sun, continue to move Rising Sun forward in a positive fashion. So welcome. We are very excited to have you. Uh, next is uh, a recommendation to appoint to the Town Planning Commission and that is Commissioner Offenreath. Uh, Mr. Mayor, we need to postpone that for just a little bit. We're still waiting on all the, the vetting to go through and the paperwork. Uh, got a little ahead of ourselves on this. Okay. Uh, next is the appointment to our town ethics board, which is Commissioner Warnick. Yeah, so uh, we've recently had an um, uh, inquiry by uh, Ms. Uh, Deborah Craig to um, be appointed to the uh, town ethics board. And uh, I'd like to make a motion that we um, uh, so move. A second. It's been moved and seconded. Any uh, more discussion? The only thing I would add is uh, I'm excited that Ms. Craig wants to um, come back and get involved in Rising Sun again. Um, I think she lent nicely when she served as a commissioner, so I'm excited that she wants to uh, get involved again. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Passes uh, the appointment to the Town Ethics Board. Um, notification of vacancy on the Board of Appeals. Um, we do have one vacancy on the Board of Appeals with um, Commissioner-elect Brian Lashier, who will be uh, resigning from that position um, to uh, serve on our Board of Commissioners. Uh, if you are interested in serving on our Board of Appeals, um, please let the town administrator know or let myself know um, that you are interested in serving, and I will certainly um, uh, ask you to meet with our Board of Commissioners. I think it is important that they all are able to um, uh, meet you and give an opinion to myself before we formally nominate someone. So if you are interested, um, reach out to the town. Uh, Commissioner Scully. At the last meeting, which I was not present at, there was a reading of <clears throat> ordinance number 201501 which um, relates to protocols of elected officials and I think all we need to accomplish tonight is review some of the changes that have been made in the last two weeks which um, <coughs> are highlighted here and you can see that they are word changes um, particularly on this first page that do not change the context of <coughs> that paragraph 
Um, whereas we took it out in the to in addition to the as an example and does not change the context of that paragraph um, on page two um, removing the under article three the title and the words that relate to official stipends and, and compensation and re replace that with policies um, there's another uh, reference to a word change on page two which again does not change the context of that paragraph Page three, under policies and rules, um, paragraph D, um, I think the most significant change here is and shall be uh, made a part of such rule um, in that, um, again, does not change the context of that paragraph. Policy A, interactions with personnel and proper processing of personnel related issues. This is not a new um, addition. No, the, the original document did not have titles next it didn't to policy have titles A, next so to this it. sort of gives the reader a visual of what's going to be contained below it. Okay, but all, all that was contained here was yeah. read out in the last, yeah, last meeting, so I am going to jump to page 6, policy B, titling that policy, individual elected officials to serve as part of a collective board and legislative body. Again, all of these... Um, Provisions under policy B were read out in the last meeting. We just provided a title to it. Page eight, um, we added some language um, within the um, second paragraph here or attempt to change the scope or any portion thereof. Again, does not change the context. Policy C provides a title and proper use of physical and intellectual property personnel and resources of the town. And policy D provides a title, improper and harmful representation of the town and frivolous acts against the town. Um, page 10 um, relates to, in D2, relates to taking legal action against the town and just uh, further clarifying that legal action um, that is unsuccessful and not related to a claim of discrimination or other like charge and we removed um, criminal activity. And the most significant change here is the addition on page 11 of a policy E, failure to attend, participate in reimbursement to the town. Elected officials have a great deal of responsibility and are in charge with keeping the town's best interest at heart and to act in a financially responsible manner. In order to fulfill this responsibility, elected officials are encouraged to participate in various meetings, training, seminars, and conferences. Elected officials are free to establish the levels of participation that they are able to make. However, elected officials are also reminded that some of these meetings, trainings, seminars, and conferences require an advanced payment of funds by the town to reserve and secure the officials' participation in those events, and as such, they are expected to attend and participate in those events. And the rules added, an elected official that agrees to attend, requests to attend, or signs up to attend a meeting, training, seminar, conference, or other such related events, but does not participate or attend such event or portions thereof, shall be required to reimburse the town for any or all portions of the cost paid for by the town, and that is not recoverable by way of refund or credit issued to the town, unless extenuating circumstances exist and reimbursement is waived by a majority vote of the neutral members of the Board of Commissioners. So that was an added provision from the last meeting. Page 12 um, relates to accountability um, for the mayor and the town board of commissioners. And there was more uh, detail involved in fining uh, officials. And we have um, chosen to uh, take out A1 through A4 and just impose a fine of between five and 500 or a written reprimand or a written censure and make that a little um, more um, broad. And um, that changes, we took out um, number four, mayor and board of commissioners are not bound, however, to follow this. This We took that out and instead replaced it with, um, well, we actually just took it out and moved um, number five to number four, which was read in at the last, last meeting. Um, some other number changes, numeric changes that resulted in um, the fact that we added a provision. So I trust that those that were here at the last meeting um, have and heard the readout of the entire um, ordinance, um, can understand the, some of the minor word changes that we made to provide further clarification and the addition of the policy. Commissioner Scully, just for the folks that are watching this on TV that can't quite see the text, 
um, it's a fine of between fifty dollars and five hundred dollars, not five dollars and five hundred. Oh, sorry, yeah. I said so it just, wrong. So the people watching fifty, TV. fifty to five hundred is what yeah. I was supposed to be reading <laughs> and speaking. <laughs> Um, so with with that being clarified and some of the changes that were um, put in place in the last two weeks, um, I would um, make a motion before the board to um, carry this ordinance. Second. Does anyone else have any discussion? I have some discussion that I'm going to bring up, and that is under Section C1, uh, which is on page 9. Um, I've mentioned to Commissioner Scully and to Commissioner Warnick that I myself will be in violation um, where it says there shall be only one town letterhead and no individual elected official letterhead. I do have an office of the mayor letterhead that I uh, send out letters to schools when I go to visit them. Um, also when I do community events that uh, comes from the office of the mayor. Um, so what I want to know, um, town administrator, is, is if this is passed, is it correct that I'm assuming that I will be fined for using that letterhead? Before, um, do you want to address that, or do you want me to address it? Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it, yeah, if, why don't you address it? My, the, the conversation that I have with the mayor today and, you know, understanding that this is guidance and, you know, for a purpose, we recognize, I certainly recognize the purpose of his mayor letterhead and the specific use of it for giving a symbolic gesture to, um, a, a you know children's organization a school or things like that that if not used in an official capacity where he was sending um, a, a letter under that letterhead to communicate at a position on behalf of the town which is not what the purpose of that is for I think it's more of a symbolic nature that I certainly did not feel that that was a violation of this and something that we could um, agree to um, uh, to an understanding, but I don't think that it's a violation that results in a fine. That's that's a little extreme. And I think the key words here are official town business. Yeah. Whereas. Do you agree? Okay. All right. That's all I wanted was some clarification for that because I don't want to end up in an issue of where, um, say, you have a town official um, who doesn't care for another town official and they write something on letterhead you know, they could say that they violated it and then, you know, take it amongst the board. So I just wanted to um, confirm. May, may, yes. may, um, let me just say, I guess, for clarity's sake, uh, sake um, that obviously the town's gone through a rough haul over the last couple of years, a good handful of years, three, four, five years. And there's been a lot of things that have been done that have led to legal expense on the part of the town, confusion with our funding agencies and stuff. So, you know, what what we're attempting to do, I guess, is to look at the bigger picture. And you raise a good point. The intent is not, you know, the intent here is to go after the things that have quite frankly caused the town a lot of money over the last couple of years because of a, a disregard for this basic business business principle. So you know. No, I mean the only thing that I would add is is uh, I fully support the ordinance, um, and I totally understand where we're coming from. You know, I think it's good for the elected body to have rules and regulations, but like I said, I think one person's intent and another person's intent can be differently, and somebody can take that intent and kind of miscue it. So, well, the one I thing, just to make not to believe the point, the one thing we put in here is that the determination of whether there is a violation is not done by the Board of Commissioners. It's put in the hands of the Ethics Board. So you would have a totally independent board with no, you know, really alliance other than just to do the right thing from an ethical standpoint. So it would be that board that would be making the recommendation to the elected body. Yeah. Thank you. Any more discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Ordinance passes. Thank you. Next on the agenda is consideration of resolution 2015-09, which is Commissioner Rothenry. Okay. Um, we haven't read this one out, so I'll be reading this out, so bear with me tonight. Uh, resolution 2015-09, titled a resolution stipend for elected officials. Uh, just a little something before I go into this. One of the problems we've run into with 
compensation of elected officials is tracking all the meetings, uh, making sure that everybody's meetings match up with uh, all the meetings that were on the calendar. Uh, make a long story short, we found that that uh, causes quite a time in the office. Uh, also with accounting, there's been some auditing issues with it. So this um, will give us a little uh, easier way of tracking all of our meetings and compensation for everyone. Whereas the town of Rising Sun, Maryland, the town is a municipal corporation duly organized and existing under the laws of the state of Maryland pursuant to a charter adopted in accordance with Article X1E of the Constitution of Maryland and Sections 4-201 of the Local Government Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland as amended. Whereas the town is proclaimed as a perpetual entity with the right to pass laws and whereas Chapter 2 of the Code of Ordinances of the Town of Rising Sun, Article 4, Section 2-401, titled Salary for the Mayor, Section 4, Section 2-402, titled Salary for the Commissioners, established the concept of a stipend or compensation for the mayor and commissioners. This, this stipend or compensation is to be set by resolution of the mayor and commissioners, and whereas the stipend or compensation of elected official is not permitted to take effect during any term of an elected official currently serving at the time of the adoption. <clears throat> and whereas the town, independent accountant and auditors have noted that the current policies in place are inefficient, inconsistent, and labor intensive to track and reconcile leading to unnecessary expense. And whereas the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun wish to simplify the process while keeping a realistic cap on what the actual expenses will be on an annual basis. Therefore, be it enacted and resolved that the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun have set the annual stipend for the town's elected officials as follows. The mayor, $275 per quarter commencing retroactively back to October 1st and paid out on a quarterly basis from that point forward. Commissioners, $275 per quarter, commencing retroactively back to October 1st and paid out on a quarterly basis from that point forward. Uh, under this we have some notes. Uh, above stipends will cover all mileage, meals, and incidentals related to one day or night events, not to include tolls which are reimbursable to the official upon submittal of the proper forms. This does not preclude the town from covering the cost of meals, mileage and other incidentals if previously approved by the Board of Commissioners or part of a normally recognized training or seminars put forth by MML, LGIT or other state agencies. Note two, these new stipend policies will take effect starting November 10th, 2015 for the two commissioners duly elected in the October 2015 election taking office on November 10th, 2015. The above compensation policies for the mayor and remaining commissioners currently in office will not take effect until November 14th of 2017, regardless of any vacancies created prior to that date. So, and it be further resolved that the mayor and commissioners of the town of Rising Sun passed, approved, and adopted this resolution on the 27th day of October 2015. Calvin, is there anything you want to add for any clarification to anyone that may be questioning? And sure. since last week I, I brought up um, a resolution uh, asking the fellow board members to uh, take uh, somewhat of a pay cut in reducing the amount of money we pay out in meals and how this builds on not only uh, saving the town money, but the auditing and accounting efficiencies and expense that this will save the town. Yeah, there's a... And I think it is important to be very clear about um, what we're trying to resolve here. In the current town charter, it states that the, um, oh, I'm sorry, in the town code, it states that the mayor and commissioner shall receive compensation for attendance at meetings and special meetings. and. I know it was in place before I got here, the definition of meetings and special meetings, uh, and I'm not going to say that it expanded, just it's, it's not just 
germane to town meetings like we're having tonight and the elected body calling for a special meeting or an executive session. Truth be told, there's a lot of involvement on the elected officials' part. There's, there's signing checks, sometimes one and two times a week. There's meeting with vendors, uh, you know, park and rec director, um, with all the activities we've had going on in the past at the dog park. There could be daily meetings that need to take place. And there's a lot of time associated with that. So in the past, elected officials would look at that as something that qualified as a meeting, and they would put in for their $20 for that meeting. But what really becomes cumbersome is you have some good-hearted elected officials in the past that I've seen that might be called to the town for five meetings in one day, and they struggle with, well, should I put in for it? Should I do all five? Do I do two out of five? Whatever, and it becomes a catch-22. And the other issue is that when we ask the elected officials to put in the meetings that they attended at, sometimes we get these anomalies where one, three elected officials might have attended the meeting, but only one of them put in for the meeting, and then it bodes the question of, well, how come the other two didn't put in for the meeting? And with all the, I mean, look, again, this, I've been saying this over and over, everything we're doing from this point <clears throat> forward is to try to compensate for things that we've learned from as a town. And we had financial issues a couple of years ago. We put some very strict, uh, financial policies in place, which include an independent um, accountant and an independent auditor, that we pay them to make sure that your money is well protected and is documented. And so when you have elected officials, one puts in for a meeting, but two don't put in for the same meeting, you would expect the auditor or the accountant to say, well, what is this about? And so we're paying them to try to find that information. Then we have downtime with staff, and at the end of the day, we could potentially be paying as much as what the total checks are for all the elected officials in that period of time. We could be paying that much, if not more, and just reconciling all of this stuff. So what we did uh, to eliminate that, we then said, well, what is a reasonable stipend to do? So we went back to 2009 here, and we got the total of all the elected officials and what was paid in 2009, 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14, and nine months of 2015. If you throw out the nine months of 2015 and just go from 09 to 14, the average amount of money that the elected, the town was paying elected officials was $6,297 for the entire year. If you go back and look at the last three years, because we sort of have a different dynamics, we've done a lot of different things with the way we run town business here, and we have a different type of board, so you start to look at what the average amount is just over the last three years with the faces that you see are very familiar here. And so if you take the nine months and project that out to where it will likely be at the conclusion of 12 months, that comes out to 5,470. Last year it was 5,524. and 2000 it was 5,220 for an average of $5,404.81 over the three-year period. So then what we said is, well, what's a reasonable number to pay an elected official? And the other thing that we want to do is think of this past election cycle. We didn't get any candidates really until like 3.30 on the last day to file. And so something that we do have to be realistic about it, if somebody's going to volunteer their time, what are they going to get out of this? And it's hard when somebody asks me and they say, well, you know, is there any compensation? Yeah, $20 a meeting. Well, what does that come out to? I have no idea here. So at least on one hand, you can, you can sort of put some parameters to what it means to be an elected official and, you know, to, to benefit the town in a variety of ways. So we chose 275 for the mayor's position and 275 for each of the four commissioners and at the end of the year, that would come out to $5,500, which is lower than what it was the preceding six years in this analysis, but it's in line with what we've been doing recently. So 
The beauty of this is this is done by resolution. This is not done by charter, so you don't have to go through charter changes and stuff like that. It's not done by ordinance where you got to go through all the hoops of passing an ordinance. This is just done by resolution. So at any given time, the elected body can come in here and say, we don't like this and we need to change it. The protection to the taxpayers in terms of the integrity is that the elected officials cannot raise or lower their compensation during their term of office. So what you have here is this sitting board of which one member is going to be leaving is setting the policy for the new board members coming in, but the mayor and Commissioner Warnick and Commissioner Authenreath will still be going by that $20 per meeting thing. But it should come out relatively consistent to what we're proposing to pay the two new commissioners. So there was a lot of thought put into this to try to come up with something reasonable. So that's the background information of where the numbers came from in the resolution. Can we do this one tonight or do we need to let yes, it sit? Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah. Well, then I make a motion that we adopt Resolution 2015-09. I'll second. Any discussion? I do have a little discussion, which is uh, the one thing that we did change uh, from the first resolution that I saw was the difference in the amount of the mayor's salary. Yes. Um, and the one thing I had a discussion with you was, I'm not speaking for myself, but the mayor does attend more things than what commissioners do. Um, so obviously that's why it was considered in the beginning as to why the mayor should have made more was that you know that he attends more things he does more things so but I, I completely agree with it I think it's fine I mean it's not going to take effect for me obviously until whoever right. takes over the seat so yes all right uh, any more discussion hearing none all in favor aye aye passes thank you Commissioner Warnick yep so uh, the last thing I guess out of the business meeting items here we uh, uh, Meadows Construction has recently done some work for us, and uh, we have a public works vehicle down at the public works yard that is uh, quite old, and it is, um, I mean, we considered scrapping it for junk, like, you know, taking it, hauling it, getting it weighed, and probably getting like $100 for it. I mean, it's, it's in that bad a condition. At least three. Huh? At least 300 It probably wouldn't get that much, honestly. <laughs> Scrap metal's not that expensive. But it's, it's in pretty bad condition, honestly. It doesn't run. It's completely rusted out. Um, it's pretty old, but uh, Meadows is interested in it for spare parts for one of his trucks. And uh, he's actually offered us uh, $1,500 in um, exchange. So basically, we'll give him the truck in exchange. He'll discount uh, his most recent invoice by $1,500, uh, therefore allowing us to get significantly more value for the truck than we would have um, had we... Uh, uh, to try to sell it outright or send it to auction or anything. Commissioner Warnick, I would add for transparency, again, because we're, we really strive to be transparent, we already had the invoices from Mr. Meadows in hand before he came up, so there's no, hey, I'm going to give you this invoice, wink, wink, I'm going to lower it, I'm going to make sure, that, you know, that the 1500 is reasonable. We already had his invoice, so it, it's a true invoice that we got. And he's offering to take 1500 off that in exchange for parts to the vehicle. Yep. And he said as soon as, uh, if we would be willing to, he'll have it towed out and, and uh, get it out of our way, which would be good because it, it is cluttering up the, the yard. Um, and th this particular truck is realistically of little value. I mean, it's not like it runs or anything. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, um, with that, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, uh, take him up on this offer. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner Warnick. Next on the agenda is citizens' input. Mr. Fisher. <clears throat> My name is Robert Fisher, and I would like to address Mr. Rothenreath. Uh, Mr. Rothenreath. Uh, made some comments about me in the last meeting, I believe, and uh, they were according to his facts. Well, his facts don't correspond with my facts, so I would ask Mr. Mothenreath to provide me with the facts that he used in coming to his conclusion, and then we'll reconcile whose facts are correct. 
Mr. Fisher, at the, uh, a meeting a month or so ago, you challenged me to get my facts straight before I run my mouth. So you're still challenging me to get my facts straight. Am I correct in that? Because uh, the, the facts that I brought to the board that night, and you chose to leave before my presentation that night to go watch the debate, was your exact words. Uh, they're right here. If you would like them, you go through the proper channels with the town administrator to request them. I've gone but, through the, the proper channels. I've asked Calvin twice. I've filed a Freedom of Information Act okay. request. I don't know what more you want me to do. Then if you've done that, then I guess you will be getting them uh, as duly processed. Well, to, to clarify, Mr. Fisher has asked me for the information that you had that night at the meeting. We have our records in the file. Mr. Fisher has asked us to see all of the records related to Sunrise Estate, Commissioner uh, Warnick, you know that's four or five boxes in several different locations. Our intent is to get all of that information in one location and sit Mr. Fisher down like we've done before in front of all that stuff, and he can go through it and pick out whatever it is. I don't, okay. And I will don't will there be somebody there to make sure that these yes. documents, once are viewed, are not do not disappear? Yes, that, okay. that is our practice. Because there was only one document in that packet that I spoke directly to you about, and that Everything else was directed directly well, I've to done the town. A, a search in, on your assertion, and I can't come up with the supporting information. I've checked. The oh, I'm sure you can't. Of course, you're not going to agree with me on this. And if you want to challenge me further, I'll be glad to to go into it deeper. But the facts are the facts. I've got them right here. And, uh, and all I need, I, I would. That's all I want to see. The facts. That okay. You. I'll turn the facts that I have back over to Calvin, and you go through the proper channels. But it's I didn't dig up nothing uh, out of the bathroom or something and make up any story. Uh, all the information about what happened in the past is here in this building. And I think that um, all I had to do was go and pull them out, and, and there they were stating, you said Frederick Ward was the engineer, and you were correct. And he notified the town um, of what was going on up there and what was not being done. And that's what I brought to the town's attention. One letter from you telling uh, the developer to disregard Frederick Ward's recommendations. The rest of it was what the town and commissioners done at that time. And I will. I'll go back in and look for more facts, and I'll be glad to bring them up at the next meeting. Okay. Commissioner well. Alton am I wrong in thinking that there is a, a file that you used that was under his signature or it was his writing is that correct mr. i have fisher? a letter from mr fisher to the developer at that time okay. that was in the town's records it's all here fun i uh, have checked the re land records and the only thing i can find concerning uh and i'm only interested in section four four a and five of of Sunrise Estate, so that's all. But well, the, I, I, many of your facts were wrong, and, and okay, I, I brought well, up what was. I, I certainly, if if they're wrong, they're wrong. But I don't. That's why I looked into I, it. I, I was only a part time, and the conditions when I worked for the town as a town administrator. First of all, I only only worked from. Uh, January the 7th, 1987 till 1988, uh, before uh, July the 1st, because the contract was on a yearly basis and I, it wasn't renewed in 88. So I wouldn't have worked because I resigned before the time was up. So I, that's what I need from your records when I actually resigned from the town. Well, I don't know when you resigned, but I know when you sent the letter to the developer. It was in March of 1988. I know when it was. And and the final plat was recorded for Section 5 of Sunrise Estates was done on June the 6th, 1988. And I believe I was gone by that time. So it would have been about the uh, before the plat was approved, the plat was signed for the town by Mr. Charles Ritchie, 
not by me. I didn't have any authority. I was only a temporary employee of the town, paid by Metropolitan, uh, Wilmington Metropolitan Area Council, and, uh, and it was on a yearly basis, and it was funded on a grant from Maryland Department of Community and Economic Development. So, you know, I think you're making a big deal, I don't know, not very much, because I was only trying to, just to point checking, out to you just first. checking my facts like you asked, um, okay, Mr. Fisher. Well, That's all. Well, and I'll, I'll make sure that the, the same information. When am I going to get them? Uh, when I turned over the letter that I have held on to, because I knew you were going to come and challenge this because you got caught uh, trying to throw Frederick Ward under the bus, basically, and make them accountable for what happened. Yeah, it's pretty that's, funny. It that's is a I joke, know. Mister. No, it's not. It has to be a joke. It's right here. It's not a joke. I've checked. I would not Frederick joke. Ward also. I would not joke. They have about no this. records. There's nothing funny about this. I would not joke about this. You challenge me to get my facts straight before I run my mouth. I challenge you, sir. Do the same thing. Take your own advice. Well, I'm, and I think your time is up. Well, you've taken up most of it. Answering your question, sir. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. All right. Does anyone else have any other anything they would like to say? Hearing none. Chief. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Um, as I started last meeting with the uh, presentation, um, slideshow type of a presentation, we're going to continue that this week, and uh, we've expanded it a tad bit. Um, you've also got a call blotter in front of you that gives you a detailed list of what calls we responded to or initiated in that two-week period. Um, there were 334 calls for services that we responded to. Um, we had 16 hours of training, 12 hours during the election, and 18 hours at the Spooktacular. The special project areas in Valley View, we spent 7.5 hours of, of foot patrol, um, had approximately 17 contacts, that's including what was reported last uh, meeting. Um, and three warnings. Uh, if you notice, the uh, number of citations are going down in those areas. So that tells me that we're changing some of the uh, behavior um, in the area. The complaint we received along Reynolds Avenue, <coughs> excuse me, um, the officers have put in quite a bit of foot patrol in that area. They found that some of the um, maintenance problems that were outlined have been taken care of by the residents. We're not seeing or hearing the the dog complaints as we were hearing before, um, and none of the traffic complaints or vehicles that were, you know, supposed to be spinning wheels and uh, dirt bikes or uh, four wheelers driving up and down a road. We have not found that to be uh, something in the area. The complaint of speeding along Broadleaf Court. We've uh, spent six hours of speed enforcement. We haven't written any citations or had any vehicles come through at a s significant speed to uh, initiate a warning. Um, the passing of school buses and speeding along West Main Street. We've spent two hours of traffic monitoring during the period when the buses are discharging and picking up. And at this time, we've not found any traffic uh, offenses there either. The Keppel's Mill complaint. This complaint, you're going to see very little results in um, because I believe the residents there are starting to catch on about parking on that corner. Um, and uh, the speeds coming up and down the road on Mount Street are starting to reduce somewhat. Um, so we are having some effect. We spend a great deal of time at the Rising Sun Middle School. Um, we have 26 hours of patrol. The day or hours should have changed. Um, that is an error. We've, uh, we spend a great deal of time there. 
um, interacting with the kids and uh, making sure that the area is safe. And uh, the criminal arrest for the town. We've arrested one person for possession of heroin, two with possession of heroin with the intent to distribute. Um, we had one person that also had possession of meth to the, the, uh, with the intent to distribute, one fraud case with an arrest, um, one resisting arrest case, and one gentleman who failed to appear for a uh, court case. The results of our traffic enforcement throughout town, we've issued one equipment repair order, two speeding citations, and six moving violations. We've issued uh, 36 warnings for speed, three for parking problems, um, 11 for equipment violations, and uh, 34 other moving violations. And one side note, we had a, an interesting case. Um, when your services are connect disconnected for your utilities, that means your electric and your water, um, maybe your internet, do not take it upon yourself to reconnect those. It is considered theft. We had an incident where that occurred and uh, we were able to um, get photographs of the, uh, the culprit turning the service back on themselves and they are being prosecuted. So when you are disconnected, understand do not turn it back on because you will be charged with a crime. With that being said, that is my presentation, um, unless there's any questions. Yes, sir. That um, acronym on here, Park Gate, did you find out what that was? I see it's that is basically, uh, when they say Park Gate, it's just checking the park. Um, because it's a countywide system, they use the term Park Gate because in Perryville you may have a park or in Elkton you have a park that has a exterior gate. Yeah. Um, we don't have that here. That makes sense. So, Okay. But it, that's what that is for. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Ms. Wagner. Yes. Can I, can I just add one thing? The Chief was talking about the utility stuff. Please contact us when you have issues with your utility bill. We do work with people on payment plans. And we there's a lot of people that you know, we've been able to work through that process with. It's when we completely get ignored over it that it creates the issue. So please at least reach out to us and, you know, we, we can potentially work something out. If you open your book, you're going to find that you have three months, and believe me, I'm not going to go through all three months. So if you find the purple tab and you turn all the way to that one, you will see that that's September 30th, 2015. Um, Commissioner um, Warnick, is there a way that we can get a letter saying that they are going to give us that $1,500 off our bill for the auditors? Uh, some no, type of right yeah. credit so that we can attach it to the yeah. invoice or we'll have an issue with that when we get around to auditing next year. Yeah, makes sense. If you um, turn to the first page, you're going to see that the management rep, the um, report letter has changed. And that is due to the fact that on December 15th, ZARS 21 comes into effect and our office is proactive, probably because one, I'm a peer reviewer, which means I go and I audit other accounting firms so I want to make sure the letter is accurate. <laughs> and uh, we started last month making all these changes to our letters. So before it used to say, I am compiling your financial statements. Now the idea is to make management responsible, because you are responsible for these statements. So that is the boilerplate letter, as you want to call it that comes down from the AICPA. So I just wanted to let you know that that letter will be slightly different, but in a lot of senses it says basically the same thing. It's just moving your responsibility up to the very top so that you see what your responsibility is. 
you turn to page three, and uh, one thing I was talking to Commissioner Scully about the uh, cash and cash equivalent restricted. She told me that it was removed and that she is going to give me the paperwork and then we will see it being brought up to cash and cash equivalent. So that is not restricted anymore. Um, so we have total cash of about 565,000. We have investments of 122,000 and we have receivable because we booked the whole receivables for the real estate taxes all up front on July 1st and we have 448,000 left to still collect. We still have a little bit of uh, money due from Maryland or Cecil County of 2000 and then we have some other receivables of 38. So our total assets for the government is $1,177,916.07. We have left of accounts payable of $10,144.30. And as we get farther away from July 1st, you will see all of that go away. Um, and then we have unrestricted funds of 642400 If you turn to the next page, and this is the reason why it was so high, because at the end of last year, and I, our number agrees to the audited financial statements because I've seen the the draft of them, you will see at the very bottom of the page the net position at the beginning of the year. I'll give Calvin a second to catch up. Farther down, Calvin. Of um, at the bottom of twenty-two thousand nine hundred and eighty-eight, and then you see that we've had six hundred nineteen thousand. Now that's not what we call a real true picture because, of course, we've gone and accrued the $837,000 worth of real estate taxes because half of it we've almost received it. And in each month we will spend and there won't be as much money put in the kitty. It just all happens at the beginning of the year, basically. So we have $1 million that we received in the first quarter and we've expensed $400,000, leaving $619,000. $412.30. Any questions with regard to that? Okay, I think we will just go to the supplemental information and let's see where we stand on page eight, budget to actual. Actually, year to date, we're running about $13,795 above mm -hmm. the budget, which is nice that we're not running under. Patty, did you say page eight? Mm -hmm. Eight. So page eight. Okay, sorry. Okay. So we are running good to the budget, revenue, actuals, um, by $13,795.68. And we have spent less than what we were planning on spending by $59,760.88. And the majority <clears throat> of this is in... Um, Looks like salaries, 36,000 of it. But I don't think um, we had everybody hired for the first quarter that we were planning on, did we? Um, we've had reduction in staffing. Yes. But we've not moved forward with any new hires. All right. So that's part of what that amount is. And the other is um, we had budgeted um, for vehicles, and we don't have that of 38,000 between that and the salaries. That will be moving forward here soon. So sometimes what happens is, is it happens in the budget first and then we, we get around to catching up later. Any questions with regard to the budget to actual for the government? Okay, then you'll have your red tab and you'll have the proprietary and you will see the letter changed here also. And... Um, Basically, we have $348,119 in cash, and we have $903,891.56 in the MLGIP. We have receivables of service charges of $149,000, and then we have amount due from other funds of $812,070. We have a lot of money outstanding between the various funds right now. 
we have a restriction of catch of $1,901,741.35 at the end of June. That was $4 million. We went to bond. We took out the USDA loan for $8 million. We paid off the $13,000. So actually, in some senses, we've reduced our debt considerably, but we will be borrowing back on that to finish the sewer project. And we have this $1,901,741.35 to pay for the sewer project. We have net assets of $19,322,947 for total assets of $23,438,327. One of the things that you will notice is the statements that look like in the audited financial statements. We added their titles and everything. We try to get a little bit more toward their grouping schedules so that there would be less confusion when we they started looking at our financial statements and comparing them. Trying to make it a little bit easier for them since we're tracking it on a monthly basis. Amounts due to other governments, this is the Bay Restoration of $23,533.53. And basically what will happen is at the end of the quarter, which is in November 15th, I think we just cut the check and they signed it, we actually paid that amount of money we owe. And then amount due the other way to the funds is $286,698.86. We have long-term debt of $14,268,558.36. And we have net investment in capital assets, which is basically your fixed assets, less depreciation, less your long-term debt, is the investment that they say is reserved that covers your fixed assets. And then the rest of unrestricted is 3805147 and that balances. If you see on page four, you have um, $325,260.39, and you have ex total expenditures of $258,603.46 for a operating income of 66000 656.93, and then we have um, some other little additions. So basically, the change in that is a positive of $62,677.64. And just so you know, we have a $300,000 interest payment coming due, I believe it's November, is it? Yes. So once the sewer project is right now you don't see the interest it all goes capitalized because until the sewer project is completed we have to capitalize the interest once the sewer plan is totally completed up and running then we will start expensing that interest so I just want to let you know there's a very large hit that's going to happen in November if we go to page 8 again you will see the budget to actual, and we are in the positive. The actual revenue ran over above the budget by $4,291.97. You will see that in the expenditures, we spent less by $115,550.91. $62,765 of that is mainly your contract services and some of that probably was truly spent it was just capitalized the engineering cost and certain different things with the sewer project is still being capitalized because the you know it's considered a, a fixed asset and then the other would be in salary and wages is the other area where we have saved a lot of money any questions Okay, um, just to let the new commissioners know, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I have a very open door policy, as some of the other commissioners can tell you. Take her up on it, guys. I, I did. It'll clear up a lot of things. Thank you, Ms. Wagner. Town administrators, this is a typo, or do you have no report this evening? Um, do I drive update? 
Um, the paving and restoration for Ryan Drive will start this Thursday. Uh, we just got notified of that yesterday. We did have a pre-construction meeting last week to sort of map out the issues. Um, I think some of the important things that I want to um, assure the residents is that we're going to be very aggressive in that area trying to make the repairs. But the contractor has assured us that the road will be drivable every day. They will leave it in a condition that it can be drived upon. Basically what we're going to be doing, because we have such a short window, is down towards the, you have up in the cul-de-sac where it looks like a bomb went off in it. That is all going to be removed and hauled out of there and then a new stone bed put in there or that the ground compacted, a new stone bed put in, compacted. And at the same time, the water service, the remaining water service connections on the end heading down to Sunrise Drive and Circle are going to be replaced. So there's going to be two different events going on at the same time. Um, we estimate that the water service connections will probably take about two weeks to complete. Um, that can mean that we will have interruption of water service throughout the day. It doesn't mean that the water is going to be out all eight hours. Um, they are going to try to get in, like our crews did, and dig you know, five or six of them up at the same time, get it where they're ready to make the connection, shut the water off, make the connection, turn it back on. If all goes well, maybe you know, we're without water for an hour or two, if all goes well. Um, and then at the same time, when I say the road will be drivable, you will be driving on stone because they are removing the roadbed out of there. But it will be leveled out stone uh, that you can drive on. Um, there will be equipment parked. If you go up Ryan Drive and reach the intersection of um, Sunrise Circle, and make the right, that little dead-end stub that goes out towards Montgomery's Field, there will be uh, construction vehicles parked in there. There are two houses in that section. One property owner goes to Florida every year. They just left yesterday morning, so they're good. The other property owner, we just have to make sure we don't block his driveway. Uh, for the fire company standpoint, uh, we're, not, we're not expecting any situations where the fire company can't get access uh, back to there or any emergency services vehicles. Um, obviously, the one issue we're going to have is this can be a very temperamental time of the year from a weather standpoint. Um, as I had said before, that what we have instructed the contractor to do is we, we don't exactly know what we're going to get into when we start picking away at the rest of that road. We know what the road did when the three-quarter inch water service lines broke, we saw the excessive damage in there. We're hoping that as they dig things up, we don't have more collapses or a lot of water ran through that development. So we could hypothetically open up a service connection and maybe find a, you know, an eight-inch sort of cavern where water was allowed to run down through there and all the stone was removed from it. Obviously, we need to repair that. So in a worst case scenario, we have instructed the contractor along with the engineer to make the call that if we get too far along in the weather process where we don't think we can get the entire thing done, we will put a top coat back over it again. So the residents will be driving on a blacktop surface. We just won't be able to complete all the other work down in there because we're just running out of time. With the idea of when the weather breaks in the spring, we'll come back out and start it again. But we're keeping our fingers crossed that we'll be able to get in there and do the project um, from beginning to end with, without any issues. Um, the other item that I have for you is um, we gave you, f the elected body, copies of the updated charter for the town. Um, there was a delay in getting that. The town made charter changes back in 2012 and 13, and the state finally just got them up on, our webs on their website, but we have not actually received the paper copies of them yet. 
So we all know we've had a lot of charter changes, and it gets really difficult to track those when they're just individual charter resolutions. So it's good to have the updated charter the way the, um, the, way the uh, state sees it. The other thing is at the last meeting, the ethics board came and reported to the elected body about concerns they had regarding the election process. Um, um, the way the uh, the way the the uh, clarification and certification of elected officials was going down, um, the commissioners had some comments over the last uh, over the days after that of how we should revise it. I had a meeting with the town attorney. Um, we have a homework assignment to reach out to the state to see how they handle some of these issues. And we are getting the ethics board together next Tuesday to begin discussion. So on behalf of the ethics board, uh, they thank you for making the appointment tonight because now they have a, a full board to be able to deal with uh, making those recommended changes. Um, the sewer plant, to sort of uh, piggyback on what we have been talking about the, before, um, this is, you know, I guess you have to be a nerd to appreciate this to some degree, but we do have the new permit from MDE for the new sewage treatment plant. So this is like a major thing to actually have the permit in hand for it. Um, as Commissioner-elect um, Lashier can attest to, uh, we went down to the sewer plant last Friday, I guess it was, to, to, to meet MDE on their inspection and they were very ecstatic. They were actually very ecstatic and impressed with that sewer plant. The woman that we have dealt with before who could just be a very tough environmentalist in the past, if the town's got to fix this stuff, was like giddy, like you guys are treating the DNR uh, uh, already. You're already doing this. We told you you had a year before you had to treat to that quality level. You're already treating that way now. And so she was beside herself and also told us that as a result, there could be some funding assistance that we could get from the state for the, op the actual operation of the plant. So we're going to continue um, to research those funding opportunities too. Um, as I said at the last town meeting, um, and, I, and I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my foot on the gas pedal because it's something that's been hanging here for a long time, our property maintenance code. We are still getting hammered by people complaining about our, you know, the lack of property maintenance codes, abandoned vehicles, vacant houses, so forth and so on. And there has been some discussion about um, the property maintenance code is basically proposed to be adopted as a book that will have, I forget, maybe 14 chapters in it. And so some of the chapters that are a little bit more, need a little bit more further discussion, we could adopt this property maintenance code and do what you will see quite often at a code book, you know, chapter nine reserved to a later date with no language in there. That way we can get real legitimate language about snow removal on sidewalks because we've all been dealing with that issue and that's coming up again. Abandoned vehicles, high grass, vacant properties we could potentially adopt portions of this property maintenance code and leave the, the chapters that have more discussion uh, left blank. So I'm just throwing that out there again. The other item that I wanted to um, bring up, and Mayor, if you in, indulge me for a second, because I do think that this is important. At the last meeting, we didn't- The fire thing? Excuse is the fire it? thing? Yes. Yeah, we didn't talk about it at the last meeting because of time. Um, and let me back up and state this about it. You know, smoke detectors came into existence and what we were hammered as, you know, when we were younger kids, um, raising families, we were all hammered over the virtues of smoke detectors and how they saved people's lives. And the, and the documentation is clearly there. But one of the things that's really startling, and you're talking to somebody who was in the fire service for 20 years and in code enforcement, when smoke detectors first came out, it was, uh, it was sort of widely accepted that you had about 17 minutes 
to get out of a residential fire when the fire started. With all the fancy stuff that we're putting in materials today, it's estimated that that number is actually less than three minutes. And when you look at some of the studies, I think 20, 20 or 60 minutes did a, a show a while back, They've done some studies where children especially do not wake up when smoke detectors go off. Some adults don't wake up to it. This is just sort of a, a video. Again, it is, it's the tail end of Fire Prevention Month, and I just wanted to show this uh, video here. I've been in the fire service for 15 years. Ever since I was a little kid, it was my dream to be a firefighter. <laughs> It's nothing like it is in the movies. It's totally black. You can see nothing. You hear sounds. You feel heat. It's about the only senses that you have. Well, there's no magic. You put the wet stuff on the red stuff. That easy. But now the situations you run into in modern homes versus older type construction homes, that changes things. One of the things we're doing in the fire service is doing a side-by-side -side comparison between a room with new furnishings and a room with older legacy furnishings. The newer furnishings are made out of synthetic materials, and the older ones are made out of natural materials. Look at your timer on the right-hand side. Seconds or so. 29 seconds, high, and the room with the new furnishings is fully in place. We can have temperatures that are hundreds of degrees at the ceiling. And in the older home, the fire may not even be blazing much at all. Research by many organizations, including UL, have shown that fires today burn hotter and faster. 30 or 40 years ago, you had on average about 17 minutes to escape your home in a fire situation. Today, that 17 minutes is down to just three or four minutes. The reason is the homes are generally bigger, which means more fuel, and they have an open floor plan, which allows the fire to progress much more quickly. But the most important thing is that homes today have a lot of synthetic materials that were not around 20 or 30 years ago. Synthetic material is involved in your drapery, in your furniture, the stuffing in your pillows, in your mattress. A family's best defense in a home fire is to have working smoke alarms, and then new homes have a home sprinkler system. Smoke detectors do save lives. Absolutely. Seeing it. So the point in bringing this out is, if you remember a couple of years ago in Cecil County, there was a big fight between the fire service and some of the county officials over the international code. And again, international is it's, it's what it is, international recommendation that all newly constructed residential homes have a fire sprinkler system in there because of exactly that. You saw in 22 seconds that one room was just fully engulfed there. Um, so what sometimes when we, when we view codes as being very intrusive, they're really not. It can be the difference between somebody living and dying at an event. And, and it goes back to the question that I think you know, socially, we, we have seen in our society, people always want to hold somebody accountable for things that happen. We all know that. Everybody's suing everybody. Everybody wants an internal investigation into why things happen. And some of that might be blown out of proportion, but some of it is perfectly legitimate to ask the question. And so one of the things that, you know, I sort of want to bring out here is what role does the town of Rising Sun have in its residents? You know, if no one is watching the hen house from a code enforcement standpoint, do we end up with this kind of stuff? And so when we're talking about property maintenance code issues and we're talking about building code enforcement, there's, there's a lot of things that I can tell you that I've seen in this community that make me really nervous, and I've conveyed that to the fire company. So I just want to put that all in perspective. This is the goal of what we're trying to avoid is those types of disasters. And I think the town does have to ask itself, you know, what is our responsibility and what is our role going forward in trying to protect our residents and protect each other.
So, Mayor, that's it. Thank you for letting me bring that video. Thank back. you, Town Administrator. I think it would be very productive if there is a way that you could share that on your page, maybe our town yes. Facebook as well, maybe post yes. something about what you just said, because, like you said, um, I think people may not realize that. Yes. may not realize about all the impacts. Yeah. Uh, is it, uh, isn't the state um, changing the like state law on that and requiring? Moving in the direction of requiring sprinklers. Yeah, it is effective. They 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 bow to a lot of pressure, and really in in the tri-state area here, Maryland was the only one that did not move forward with the requirement of residential sprinklers. They allowed communities to or counties to state that we're just going to have the builder give a notice to the pr prospective property owner that you could put sprinklers in here if you wanted to. They did away with that effective July 1st of 2015. So now all new houses built. The problem that we're running into, and this is something the chief and I, uh, the, the fire chief have talked about, it's unfortunate. Sometimes we all get caught up in our own agenda and what we think is right. Unfortunately, there's a lot of developments that were built and approved when the law said you had to have sprinklers, but then they made it where you could have people sign an affidavit. And there's a large number of potential housing stock that was not required to put the infrastructure in place to support those sprinkler systems, even though everybody knew it was going to be a matter of time before they were going to be required. So what's happening now is these homes are being built and people are forced to put 500-gallon water tanks in their attic or in their basement, and now they're looking at, you know, the, the, the additional cost is like eight to $10,000 that's not just the sprinkler piping in your property, but there's, there's not a public water supply out there. And it's just a shame that we sometimes get caught up in the bureaucracy of it and don't see the forest through the trees. And so we, it can, it, you could make an argument that it could hurt economic development and Cecil County because now all you there's a lot of houses that now have to put these big tanks in and I just think it was a little short-sighted to do that so thank you town administrator moving forward uh, into uh, the mayor's report uh, my report is pretty brief uh, I did visit uh, Calvert Elementary School I was invited there by a little girl her name is Lily um, and they were learning the second grade was learning about um, what the mayor does um, and uh, what I do as far as um, on a daily basis. And uh, I did, um, I spoke to them for about an hour uh, in the cafeteria. It was about 200 kids or so. Um, and uh, I totally enjoyed myself. I love going to our schools and speaking with them. Um, and then last week, I actually received over 200 letters from the kids. So these are some of them. This is a turkey for Thanksgiving. And he writes in there that, you know, that he's giving it to me to save for Thanksgiving. Um, and then, you know, I have um, a few other ones that are to Mr. Mayor Travis. Um, but um, it was, it's going to be fun to read all of them because some of them are, are quite funny and some of the things that the kids wrote inside are, are funny. So um, I did do that. I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I love going to our schools. I love reaching out to the kids. Um, so I'm blessed to be able to do that. Um, I did want to say um, also uh, that myself and Chief Peterson will be attending a um, speaking event in Cambridge tomorrow about our relationship. You are going to be there, correct? <coughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Please don't leave me in Cambridge by myself. Um, so uh, I'm excited to speak about our relationship and uh, how things are, are moving forward in Rising Sun. Um, I also wanted to announce um, that I believe that our Spooktacular was the most well attended um, event that we have had. Um, in a long time. Uh, each year, Spooktacular um, has, you know, built upon itself. We started out with around 400 people. Uh, the first year, last year, we had around 1,000 or so, and this year we had 2,000 plus. We ran out of pumpkins within an hour and a half. We had um, 1,300 pumpkins that were donated, um, and these are some of the comments that I received from residents. Uh, we moved from the Poconos to Rising Sun in July, and we've really enjoyed connecting with people Thank you for all your work in helping to make Rising Sun such a wonderful place to live. Thank you to the elected body. Looks like a great, safe, looks like a great and safe, fun time. What an amazing event. This is exactly what small town America is about. Events like this is one of the reasons I love small town life and Rising Sun. Thanks so much for all who had a hand in making this day 
um, available. And this, this came from all the vendors uh, absolutely enjoyed themselves and they all want to come back next year. This was from a vendor and it says, uh, what a great turnout today. I went through almost uh, a thousand balloons. I look forward to more. Please let me know how I can sponsor events in the future. Um, so having feedback like that is excellent. Um, I do believe, like I said, that um, uh, Spooktacular went well and was well attended. Um, and I want to say a big thank you to Desiree Davis for partnering with me again this year in, in organizing this event and also to all the volunteers um, that spent their time um, volunteering for free. You know, we didn't pay them anything. We didn't even provide them food. Um, and a lot of the um, food vendors themselves are going to be um, giving 20% back to the town and that's going directly back into the event. So I'm very, very thankful to them. Um, I also somehow got conned into, I mentioned this before, about getting dressed up in costume. I did get dressed up. Um, that was just for a brief period of time. I also got pied in the face, um, and Mr. John Ballou was the highest bidder at $75. So um, an extra $75 for the event was great. Um, obviously, C Commissioner Warnick picked out my least favorite pie, which is lemon meringue, um, on purpose. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was great, and uh, I was very... Um, glad that we had a great turnout. Like I said, I just think it's a great event. The last thing I wanted to mention was um, actually uh, a big shout out to my friend Mike. Um, and Mike contacted me because he used to live here in Rising Sun. He now lives in California. And sometimes I don't think we realize that some people when they move away, they still want to stay connected um, with our community. And Mike sent me a message on Facebook about one of the ordinances that we ended up passing tonight and his thoughts on it. Uh, which I thought was pretty cool because, like I said, he lives in California, but he still wants to know what's going on in his hometown. So um, I think that's one of the positives about having our meetings taped. Um, to me, transparency is um, priceless. Um, yes, we may pay a little bit more for our town meetings to have them taped, um, but we're going to have that record forever. And it not only helps the residents that may have kids or may not be able to come to attend a meeting, but it also helps those that may want to catch up uh, on what's going on in their in their hometown that they used to live in. So I think that's excellent. Um, that concludes my report. Um, Historical Preservation Commission, do you have a report? Hearing none, uh, so Commissioner we'll Warnick. No, I'm, yeah, I will, uh, I'm gonna actually handle the Rising Sun Arts Council report real quick. Um, the uh, chair of the Rising Sun Arts Council had uh, surgery, um, I guess last week, and uh, uh, so she asked me to just uh, mention a few things. Um, first of all, there is a, on uh, the, the December 12th event, uh, Saturday, sa December 12th from 5 to 7 p.m. at Town Hall. Uh, there will be a gingerbread house decorating contest for all ages. There's a form available. I believe you can pick that up in, uh, uh, in the lobby. And... Um, so it's uh, show off your creativity and holiday spirit. The Rising Sun Arts Council sponsors Gingerbread Bread House Mania. Sounds like I should read that out like Gingerbread House Mania. Sunday, Maybe not. Sunday. <laughs> More like Saturday, Saturday. Um, bring or mail the attached registration form and registration fee to the town hall by December 9th, 2015. Uh, construct and decorate your gingerbread house out of edible material. You choose size, material, construction methods, Use of cardboard for base and support is allowed. Bring your gingerbread house to Town Hall, third floor between 2 and 4 on Saturday, December 12th. Invite your friends and family to come and vote for your creation. Uh, voting will be from 5 to 7, I'm sorry, 5 to 6.30. And uh, registration fee is $5, I'm sorry, $3 for uh, entry paid in advance, $5 at the door, cash or check made out to the town of Rising Sun. And uh, the money from this goes to support the arts in Rising Sun. So. Um, the uh, end prizes will be awarded at the event. So goodie bags, oh, I think you have to be under 12. Uh, 12, and 12 and under, yep, 12 and under. Um, presented to entrance and at refreshments will be served. So anyway, that's the that event, and I uh, hope people uh, take the Arts Council up on that and participate. Um, there will be, for the November uh, second Saturdays, which is November 14th from 5 to 7 p.m. There will be uh, some refreshments served, and the art show will be um, featured photography and will be open to the public to share their thoughts on what events they would like to see uh, the Rising Sun Arts, Arts, Rising Sun Arts Council have. Um, and with that, I think that's the conclusion of the report. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Warnick. I did forget under uh, Spooktacular, one of the things that I forgot to, for, um, to announce uh, was a big thank you to all of our sponsors, the businesses that sponsored this event. Uh, Crothers Insurance, um, Ace Hardware, uh, Armstrong uh, Cable, um, Way of Life Community also donated some inflatables uh, along with Ace Hardware. Um, and uh, I think the biggest thing is, is the output from the town um, has been usually typically around $500 to $1,000. Um, and uh, this year uh, we had uh, around a $3,000 budget and uh, the majority of it was covered by the businesses in this community. Um, and to have over 2,000 people in your community, for me, a $1,000 commitment from the town is nothing. Um, I think that it is um, priceless to have that many people in your community and to potentially um, visit businesses or um, spend time with their family in Rising Sun. Um, we need to give our residents um, things to be able to do, so I think that that's great. Um, so moving forward, uh, Commissioner Comments, Commissioner Alton Reef. Um, tonight, mostly what I have is some PNZ uh, information, Planning and Zoning Board information. Uh, Calvin covered uh, the Rhine Drive project, which is getting ready after almost a year to get underway and get that road restored. Uh, don't have anything else really to re report about streets and sidewalk this week. Uh, on the Planning and Zoning Board issues, like I said, we have one potential candidate that we have to finish up and hopefully we'll be bringing at the next meeting for appointment. Uh, at our last meeting, we held it on the 20th. Uh, regularly it was scheduled for the third Monday of the month, which fell on the 20, uh, 19th election day. So we held it that Tuesday, the 20th, uh, here on the third floor. And uh, we were very excited because we had a couple of scouts here that night visiting, working on their uh, citizenship badge. And we don't usually get an audience, so we were, we were happy. Um, Susie, that night, did we decide on the meeting time? We went back and forth so, so much. Did we decide 6? We committed to 7 or 6.30 seven. on that? Was it 7? Okay. We went back and forth. Um, so I think we were still discussing possibly moving that to a little earlier. But our next planning and zoning meeting is November 16th uh, here on the third floor at 7 p.m. Uh, we have some... Food. Yeah. Um, I, I think we just. Yeah. I know we talked about it so much that night, and I I looked at my notes, and I had so many things written down. I wasn't 100 percent sure. So. Tom's not here, so you can do what you want. Let's do that. <laughs> let's overrule Tom tonight. And we're going to use Tom's credit card for food for the next meeting. And we said 6, we said 6.30, we said 7. So why don't we settle on 6.30 in the middle and see if that works for everybody? What do you think? Six? Can everybody? It was Yeah. Yeah. Okay, who all votes for six? Okay, well, let's go, you know, we, like I said, we, we usually don't get an audience. It's usually us, and uh, we get a chance to have informal and a, a lot of good discussion. And those guys don't count right now. Well, it was good, yes, and, and Joe and Brian did come to our last meeting to meet the members. We invited them out, and thankfully they came out that night to put faces with the names, and... We hope to see you guys more than just one time. So, but yeah, but like we were just saying, we went back and forth about the time because waiting till seven o'clock, you know, was getting kind of late. We all get kind of run down and next thing you know, it's nine o'clock. So we're going to settle on six o'clock as our meeting time, still the third Monday of each month. Don't change it, Pauline. Well, I still have, well, I know we, sec we, we did that Monday because of the election, but I still have on my November calendar. Well, we moved the one from November, I believe it was, because it was the week of Thanksgiving, and we moved it to the following Monday. So we moved it to the 16th. 
Well, that's the third. Didn't we go with the third? Yeah, that was the third since when we were PMV board. Yeah. I, I think what we talked about was possibly not having one in December, Susie, was where yeah, well, that was I'm what it was. My thing. Yeah, because, yeah, December would fall on December 21st. That's what it was, and that was the first Yeah, we talked about moving that one up because we have a feeling with what's happened yeah, with. We to hurry up and go. Yeah, we didn't want to skip it. We didn't want to skip it because we've got too much going on now. So for November, the, the, the meeting is the 16th. 6 p.m. Everybody's welcome. It's a public event. We'd like to see somebody out. Jane. So. I apologize. I have is that, a lot of other stuff going on in my... No. Um, yeah, that was the main thing. We did a lot of discussion that night about trying to nail down a, a time. Um, we also that night decided to um, have KCI work on our uh, subdivision regulations review. Uh, I have a uh, motion I want to put forward tonight. I'll read this out. Uh, this is for KCI and Technologies is pleased to provide the services described below. The purpose of this form is to obtain your authorization for work verbally requested and to confirm the terms under which these services will be provided. Uh, the project name is the Rising Sun Subdivision Regulations Review. Scope of the work, KCI will review the current town of Rising Sun Subdivision Regulations and make recommendations for sections of the code that should be revised or updated to number one, correct existing errors or deficiencies, two, better align with other town, county, state, or federal regulations or codes, and three, to improve the overall form and function of the regulations to better suit the town's needs. It is anticipated that the following this initial review, further detailed review and recommendations will be necessary to complete the updates to the regulation that are not covered under this work authorization. The estimated fee not to exceed, and this is from the planning and zoning budget, $2,500 uh, to review our subdivision regulations. So uh, make a motion that we approve KCI $2,500 to review our subdivision regulations and make recommendations. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, other than that, Mr. Mayor, the only thing I'm going to do is remind everybody, turn your clocks back this coming weekend, as much as I hate that, but uh, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Rath. Commissioner Scully. My report is going to be brief. This is my last formal meeting, and I um, want to thank the citizens of the town of Rising Sun for their trust in me and just being so friendly and welcoming. The last 14 months that I've had the opportunity to do this, um, the mayor and commissioner board, who are not only um, great colleagues but have become good friends, town administrator, chief of police, marshal on behalf of the, the staff um, of the town, um, can't say enough about how nice it's been working with you and, and I'll still come in and, and chat with you once in a while. Jean, for taking an interest in talking to me about what it's like to, to leave this, this office. I, I was flattered. I appreciate that. And uh, welcome to our new commissioners elect. And uh, I will still see you in some meetings, but I look forward to maybe um, sleeping on <laughs> Tuesday nights <laughs> at about 8.30. <laughs> so, no, but this is fun, and I still will be involved in some capacity, and I look forward to figuring out what that, what that will be. So, thanks. That's all I wanted to say. I'm going to save uh, most of my comments that I prepared for Commissioner Scully till uh, her last official meeting, which will be the swearing-in meeting for the other commissioners. But I will say that this is going to be a um, tough chair to fill for the two new commissioners-elect. Um, the one thing I will say is, uh, and the board members that are up here are well aware, um, I was a little unsure of Commissioner Scully. Um, when I appointed her to this position, uh, I sat down and I talked to her a lot, and I called Commissioner Warnick a couple of times, and I said, you know, I'm not so sure. Um, I don't know. Um, but she really proved me wrong. Um, she is not only a great colleague, but also a great friend, um, and I am sad to see her go. Um, because I will miss being able to call her throughout the day when she's out her job. And, um, you can still do that. <laughs> talk to her about town issues. Um, 
but uh, she will be greatly missed. Um, uh, so stay involved, hopefully. Uh, Commissioner Warnick. Yeah, a um, few things. Uh, first, I'd like to congratulate uh, Joe and Brian for their uh, election victories and um, look forward to serving with them over the next uh, few years uh, on this board. Uh, the Civil War reenactment uh, went well. Um, the weather actually held off. There was a little bit of rain early Sunday morning, but uh, it didn't really uh, keep anything down. And, and frankly, it was actually reasonably warm most of the time, with the exception of uh, overnight. It, I think it got a little cold. Um, yeah, I think nothing, a little bit of straw and, and uh, blankets. Yeah, yeah, blankets and possibly the uh, little bit more modern air kerosene heaters uh, couldn't uh, take care of. Um, I uh, had a chance to meet with the general uh, on, um, I guess, Thursday and go over with him. Uh, the new trail system is under construction, and uh, he was actually excited to see. Uh, the, the trails we have in and the width of them and such, and they're hoping next year to incorporate some uh, trail skirmishes into the reenactment, and possibly um, we're going to look at trying to figure out some ways that the public can have some vantage points and they can do some uh, tactical maneuvers within the woods. So it'll be an interesting um, uh, a change for next year. The spectacular, I'd like to... Uh, thank the mayor and uh, congratulate him and all the volunteers that helped out um, with the spooktacular and uh, it was a great event it was well attended um, the it was uh, we actually were able to get the Civil War reenactors to come up and march through the event and uh, shoot at Howard Bank um, <laughs> really I wish I had seen that <laughs> so, I was I was glad that they didn't uh, you know that you know shots the, um, fired at the bank uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't do any damage to the bank, but uh, it was um, it was actually an interesting uh, um, event. But the uh, anyway, I, I got a lot of positive feedback on both events, on both the spectacular and Civil War reenactment, and um, uh, like stuff like this. Like people just they love yeah. small town events, just enjoy it. The uh, we have. Two uh, Boy Scouts, actually Eagle Scout ceremonies coming up. The two Eagle Scouts that completed projects in the dog park, uh, their ceremony is in November, and um, I look forward to uh, the opportunity to attend that ceremony and, and um, once again thank them for all the hard work they've done for the town of Rising Sun. And uh, I uh, just wanted to recognize uh, Commissioner Scully, and uh, actually, given you'll be here next meeting, I'll just save save that for uh, the next meeting accolades for you. Yeah. oh geez yeah tears and, <laughs> anyway. and with that i uh conclude my report all right Thank you. before i end tonight's meeting uh does someone want to motion to enter into an executive session I'll make a motion we enter into executive session i second it's been moved and seconded the board will enter into an executive session after a brief recess of 10 15 minutes uh can i get a motion to adjourn the meeting Hold on. You have to say what it is. Oh, yes, the executive session, Commissioner Alton Reith. Is to discuss personnel and what was the other thing, Calvin? Consult potential liability. Li 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 legal, legal action. Okay. That too. I'd like to move that we, is it suspend or? No, you can adjourn the meeting. You just adjourn. Okay. Move that, that we adjourn. Can I get a second? Second. Been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Being adjourned. <laughs>